Okay, we probably uh, better get started just because we have a lot to get through today and I want to make sure we maximise um, the time. Um, so, but I'm sure a few more people will be trickling in online and in person. Um, so welcome to today's um, seminar. This is a special seminar um, that we've uh, that we're running uh, in um, along with the team at uh, the University of Queensland uh, as part of their uh, political and environmental psychology and social sciences uh, seminar series. So very excited to be um, having a, a bit of a bigger audience today and we have quite a few people joining us online, which is great. Um, before we get Started. I just first want to um, acknowledge the traditional uh, custodians of the lands on which we're meeting today, both in person and for those joining us online. Um, for us uh, on uh, a new campus today, that's the lands of the Ngunnawal Ngambri people. We pay respects to their ancestors and descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society and I also want to make sure that we acknowledge and welcome any um, Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today um, and to uh, state that this um, uh, land was never ceded it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Given the topic for today as well, I also want to make sure that um, we acknowledge the lived and living experience of people with larger bodies um, and people who have and do experience stigma or discrimination on the basis of their weight. Um, I think perhaps no more salient than it's ever been before, uh, the importance of voice um, when we're discussing any uh, issues to do with marginalization, discrimination, um, and this certainly applies for this context as well. And I'm hoping that the seminar will be the start of a bigger conversation, um, uh, certainly at a new here in the School of Medicine and Psychology and hopefully um, uh, elsewhere as well. Um, and it's important for us to keep in mind that when we have those conversations and continue those discussions that um, we're including the voice of people with lived and living experience. Um, so today's seminar will be recorded. Um, so if you uh, don't wish to have your, your face or your voice recorded online, please do um, feel free to turn your video off. Um, and the recording will be made available on various different platforms um, and uh, they're all listed there. Um, okay. And if you're interested in finding out more about the PEP seminar series hosted by UQ, um, please also feel free to contact them at that email address or uh, you can also email me as well and I can put you in contact with the team. All right, so without further ado, I want to um, introduce our fantastic speakers uh, who are joining us today, um, Dr. Bryony Hill and Professor John Dixon. Um, so the way that this is going to work, I'm going to introduce both of our speakers um, uh, all at once. Uh, Bryony is then going to give her presentation uh, and then we'll hand over to John to give his presentation. Um, and then what we'll do is I'll ask uh, both of our speakers to reflect and comment on each other's um, presentations as well. Um, and then we'll open the floor uh, to Q&A. And for those in the room, uh, just so that we can make sure that our speakers can hear and see you, um, if you have a, a question or a comment, um, I'll invite you to come up here and, and ask it so that everyone can hear um, nice and clearly online. Okay, um, so uh, Dr. Bryony Hill is an ARC DECRA Fellow and Senior Research Fellow in the Health and Social Care Unit in the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University. She is pursuing research to understand how we can eradicate weight stigma to reduce the burden and blame on women across the reproductive life phase. Bryony applies the ecological systems theory lens to her research to recognize the broader influences on weight stigma that extend through the community, society and government. She is an advocate for co-design methods in her research to ensure relevant stakeholders have their say in the development and implementation of interventions and policy change. Professor uh, John Dixon has many titles to his name. Um, he's a, a GP and adjunct professor at Iversion, uh, Iversion um, 
Health Innovations Institute and Swinburne University. John is an experienced clinician known globally for his breadth of clinical research into obesity and its risks and complications, as well as weight loss treatments and their effects on health. He has over 300 original research and review publications in the area and is experienced with all currently available effective weight management therapies. John is focused on seeing findings translated into clinical practice and on patient advocacy for people with obesity. Please join me in welcoming um, Bryony and John. Um, so Bryony, I will stop sharing and feel free to share your screen whenever you're ready. Hi everybody, that's the moment of truth. There we go. Okay, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Joe, and thanks for the invitation today. Um, so I'm going to uh, do my presentation on a bit of a, an overview of the importance of policy at, in the context of weight stigma. Um, so the first part of my talk is a, um, presenting some findings from a systematic review that's looking at obesity-related policy um, more broadly in, in the context of weight stigma, and then I want to share with you some new findings from a review that we're currently um, conducting, a mapping review. Um, and as Joe mentioned, my main area of research focuses on women of reproductive age, so specifically across the preconception, pregnancy and postpartum periods. And so the second part of my talk will focus on that group of population. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which I'm zooming from and work from and that are the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Okay, so uh, first of all, well, what is weight stigma? And I'm just gonna move my things so I can see my slides. So weight stigma is the phenomenon of discriminating, stereotyping, excluding or devaluing somebody based on their weight or body size and particularly when it does not comply with prevailing social norms. So in Western society, we have this prevailing norm of the thin ideal. Um, and so anybody that does not have this thin, slim body is um, often discriminated against in, a very, uh, in various ways. Uh, weight stigma occurs across the socio-ecological spectrum. So it can occur, um, we can internalise weight bias. It can occur at that interpersonal level between people that we know in contexts such as workplaces, in the community, but also way up in that kind of overarching environmental um, level, including policies. So that's where policy uh, comes in. I've done the whole, I can't get my slides to move. There we go. Uh, okay, so what are the consequences of weight stigma? So it leads to a, a range of um, adverse outcomes for people who experience it, um, including both physical and mental health concerns. So um, it can not only uh, lead to an increased risk of, of mortality, but um, it leads to an increased cortisol stress response, which can then exacerbate uh, weight or body size on weight gain, and then reinforcing uh, weight-related stigma. It can lead to mental health concerns for the person who experiences it, including depression, and body image concerns and a reduced quality of life and of course we know that these factors can further compound um, or limit our abilities to participate in a uh, healthy diet and physical activity behaviors again further compounding a uh, weight stigma uh, one of the, the biggest consequences of weight stigma is um, decreased engagement with an uptake of um, health care and so this can occur in a number of ways um, including um, not going to the doctor or avoiding uh, visiting the doctor it can lead to doctor shopping so shopping around for a healthcare professional that meets your needs and that can impact your continuity of care um, but also can lead to um, decreased perceptions of the quality of care provided when someone actually does go to the doctor. Um, weight stigma can also lead to uh, disordered eating and avoidance of physical activity settings so as you can see, there are a range of consequences and they can be both direct and indirect on the um, impact of, on the individual.
Okay, so now we have a bit of an understanding of what weight stigma is. Why are we talking about it in the context of policy? So firstly, I'll go through what I think the definition of policy is and then why policy is important for weight stigma. So policies are decisions taken by those with the responsibility for a given policy area. And I like to take a broad um, brush definition of policy, uh, an inclusive definition. So that can include things like frameworks or strategies. So um, a good example is the National Obesity Strategy, action plans, policies, strategic plans, recommendations, including clinical practice guidelines and public health and wellbeing plans. But the key commonality here is that they propose a course or principle of action and they occur in the context of government, schools, healthcare, work, places or community settings. Um, and so, um, oh, again, I'm using a new software. Can you tell that I haven't got used to it yet? Um, okay, so why is weight stigma um, and policy important? So if we think about obesity-related policies, they're the most obvious policies um, that we should think about in the context of weight stigma, albeit they are not the only policies. So obesity-related policies uh, often target individuals. So they um, target the individual uh, and that person should make diet or physical activity changes in order to uh, prevent weight gain or lose weight. Uh, but obesity-related re policies do also target social and environmental factors, such as the social and commercial determinants of health, uh, improving the physical environment, such as adequate workplaces and green spaces, um, provision of appropriate um, foods available in our environment, in schools and so on. However, over the last 15 years, there's actually been very little progress in moving the focus in policies from that individual responsibility uh, to one of social and environmental context. And so why is that so important? So, um, this individual uh, focus uh, leads to a blame narrative that promote, promotes weight stigma. So this blame narrative is that the individual is responsible for the diet and physical activity behaviours. If they cannot lose weight or they are gaining weight, then it's their fault. They are at blame. And, you know, and it's not accounting for these, um, you know, diverse and very important and salient uh, broader social and environmental factors that do influence our ability to optimize our diet and physical activity behaviors, as well as not understanding the, um, the complex factors that go into the development of um, weight. Policies can be both inadvertently and blatantly discriminatory. So this can occur by a poor choice of wording or a focus on an, an individual um, rather than social environmental factors, but also they can be very obviously discriminatory, such as policies that exclude someone from particular service or healthcare based on their body size. And so in this way, policies can perpetuate stigma in society, because if we think about policies from that um, a socio-ecological lens, they can sit right at the top. And if we can't get the policies right and understand the um, contributions to development of weight and body size, then, people in the community and society, workplaces in schools are not going to get um, their perspectives right as well. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. So now I'll share with you some findings from a systematic review and the link is there if you want to look it up. Um, so first of all, what are stigmatising policies and non-stigmatising policies? So some examples of stigmatising policies include those that deny people access to healthcare based on their body size. Um, and a, a classic example is denying people access to fertility treatment based on a BMI cutoff um, or asking people to go to a different hospital that's not in their you know, catchment area based on their weight. Um, stigmatizing policies in include punitive warning labels, for example, on soft drinks, where there might be a graphic image negatively depicting obesity, as well as things like punitive price raising policies that punish people for living in a larger body. Um, and a classic example of that is, um, and it's particularly prevalent in the US, um, is health insurance policies where people are charged higher premiums because they have a larger body size. And that's therefore compounding the effect because that limits their access to healthcare or treatment um, and, you know, can reinforce weight or weight gain. 
Uh, Non-stigmatising policies might look like anti-discrimination policies that are based on weight or policies that have a really complex and true environmental focus. So we looked at factors that were associated with policy support and we did this in two ways. Um, so we looked at um, policies that had an environmental attribution focus. So policies that are considered environmental factors as really important in the development of weight and body size, um, people who saw those policies were more likely to support policies that were around the prevention and treatment of obesity. So in other words, helping people um, and not just blaming them. Um, on the other hand, policies that take an individual or causal attribution lens, so that individual responsibility and blame narrative, people who uh, endorse those policies are more likely to promote weight stigma. And they also have um, hold potentially uh, similar characteristics. So they were more likely to be male, have a lower education and be on the pol political conservative end. And people who um, endorse these kind of policies also endorse punitive policies such as um, taxes and you know hiking prices on health insurance. So not only looking at the types of policies and the characteristics associated with these, we also looked at the ways policies were implemented or evaluated. And so while um, policies do look take both individual and resp environmental responsibility lens, they are often implicitly condoning in weight stigma, often through poor language choice or this conflicting discourse. So for example, um, policies that oversimplify the energy balance, this energy in, energy out equation, are reinforcing this lazy stereotype. So if you're reading a policy like that, the subliminal message is that people who have obesity or who are living in a larger body are lazy and that they must be eating um, you know, high fat, high sugar foods, and they must never exercise. That's re subliminary, subliminal, I can't say, reinforcing that message. Um, policies can also have conflicting messages. So often this message of it's your human right to choose uh, how you live your life and what behaviours that, that you have. And, you know, at first glance, that seems like, yeah, we do have a right to choose what we do. But that's and um, kind of overlaying or, or not acknowledging that environmental responsibility uh, from governments is so important. And it takes away that um, concept of, of um, agency in the context of environment. So yes, we have a right to choose, but we may be choosing things that are influenced by our environments. And so um, policies can be quite conflicting in the messages they're sending. And finally, policies can often choose um, or not think through the wording very well. So um, an example is where a policy uh, implies that one has individual responsibility um, for their diet and physical activity behaviours. And so if someone doesn't meet those guidelines, they are failing to heed the prescriptions of the policy as opposed to considering the point that perhaps the policy is failing to adequately consider all the factors involved. Um, and so we're kind of sending the message here that policies are really, really important in the development of uh, you know, stigmatising um, attitudes and beliefs in society, and there's a lot of work to be done. Okay, so more recently I've been doing a little bit of work looking at some obesity-related policies um, in Australia. So we did a mapping review and we looked at policies related to preconception, pregnancy and postpartum women. And we searched national and state level uh, databases and registers and found 41 relevant policies. And so then we looked at the factors associated with weight stigma within these policies. And so we looked at whether they even mentioned weight stigma at all, whether they um, considered attribution theory, so whether they looked at that environmental responsibility versus individual responsibility, and then we looked at factors or constructs involved in the stigmatisation process. So to do this, we used a framework called the Health Stigma and Discrimination Framework, which looks at uh, five or six different factors that... Um, contribute to the stigmatization, the development of stigma and, and the consequences of stigma. So what did we found? We found that more than three quarters of the policies did not even recognize weight stigma at all. 
So blaringly ob uh, obvious gap there. Um, what was positive was that almost 70%, sorry, over 70% did consider environmental contributors to uh, weight, body size, or obesity. Um, but still, you know, 29% took that individual responsibility lens. Of the strategies that did address weight stigma, so that uh, around one quarter, zero addressed weight stigma in their mobilization strategy. And so that means that the implementation of the strategy or the way that the strategy was um, enacted uh, did not um, take into consideration weight stigma at all. Then if we looked at these health stigma and discrimination, uh, discrimination framework domains, um, you can see from the blue bars, which are no, that most of the policies didn't cover any, any of these. So they didn't look at, you know, what are the important drivers or facilitators of weight stigma? They didn't look at how weight stigma manifests in individuals or whether it's, um, what are the impacts of this? And they didn't take into consideration a socio-ecological approach. Uh, so I've thrown like all this information at you, but what, you know, what are the take home messages? So if you walked away from um, today with one thing on your mind, is that we have so much work to do. So policies can reinforce weight stigma and they can do so blatantly obvious and they can do so very surreptitiously. Uh, if we assess current policies today, we know that weight stigma is poorly addressed in these existing policies. So we have a lot of work to do to even get weight stigma recognised in policies. And then, you know, the next step is, well, how can we understand what to even do about it? So this individual responsibility narrative is persisting and we really need to change that if we're going to change the way people are thinking, uh, people are thinking about uh, people living in larger bodies. So much work to do. Okay, so that's thank you for me and hopefully I kept to time and just a quick acknowledgement of my funding and um, colleagues who worked with me on um, this work. Thanks so much, Bryony. Everyone, welcome. Um, all right, I'll hand over to you, John, if you want to share your screen. Sorry, John, you're you just need to unmute yourself. Yes, that's what I was just saying. <laughs> no worries. Perfect. Just let me get this up. Great talk, Prani. I really enjoyed that. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of similar themes here. So weight stigma is a complex problem. I, I've got my conflicts up there. I, I am conflict with, conflicted with almost anything that uh, generates health improvement in people living with obesity. Uh, have been involved with lots of things over a long time. And if you see up there, there's everything you know about obesity is wrong. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, there's a, the, the um, health profession have had this continual war against uh, uh, obesity and, uh, and poisoned the lives of millions of people. And down the bottom there, I thought a nice quote from uh, 60 years old, this is, uh, warning the graduating class at Yale, we enjoy the comfort of our opinions without really considering the thought. When we look at obesity from a biological point of view, almost all the determinants that drive the likelihood of you becoming obese are genetic or early life involved. Um, at least 50 to 60% genetic solely. It's a very genetically orientated disease. And then there's imprinting and epigenetic factors that come from family, et cetera. When we look at the environment, it adds most of the rest. And in fact, when you've got the genes to become obese and you're planted in our environment, you're likely to become obese if you've got the right genes. Those who are lean will never become obese uh, and they've got genes that really focus uh, on the leaner side of life. So in fact, your habits and cues and these things actually account for very little of your likelihood of becoming obese. It's rather determined from early on. And even then, most of the imprinting and those environmental factors are there in early life. So we really can't control our weight very well. The other thing is that we, we do regulate our fat like we regulate every other essential thing for life. It's, it's uh, 
Uh, it's just like breathing. It's just like um, keeping our blood glucose right, all sorts of things. We control our weight through uh, the, 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 the hypothalamus. But in fact, it's that, that experience that what the hypothalamus is getting at is then uh, extended through the cortical fact. Uh, it features the, the hedonic areas, et cetera. So when we look at uh, the um, simple fact of energy balance, energy in, energy out, of course, the law of thermodynamics is true, but we got to, we've got to get our mind around the fact that it's completely flawed because the main uh, main factor is that that's, uh, the, the assumption is that it's it's weight. Indeed, it's weight that drives our energy in, energy out. It's our physiology that drives that, and we can do very little uh, uh, about that. A small group of people can lose weight and keep it off over a long period of time. It's not a large number, uh, and uh, people battle their weight generally year after year. So when we think about how an elephant eats and how a mouse eats, we can see uh, the, uh, uh, the issue. They have very different eating patterns, and they really feed and expend energy because of their size. Now, you've heard definitions before. I just want to focus on internalized weight stigma because this is what I see is really causing so much problem. Uh, we see here the broad, broadly uh, awareness of the stereotypes that are common in our community, agreement with those stereotypes, and the application of those stereotypes to oneself and the devaluation of one's stigma, uh, stigmatized identity. I see this as a huge problem in the patients I see, in the, and I use patients and obesity as words that we use in the medical world. I apologize. <laughs> um, so internal, internalized weight stigma is something that's common and usual in the people I see. A population, 18 to 20 percent endorse it. Uh, but when we look at obesity, 52 uh, percent, and the very highest levels are those who are seeking a treatment for obesity and binge eating disorder. So when we look at um, obesity and the problems it's generating, it's a, it's a human rights and, and social equity issue. Improved diet and exercise, attacking the fast food industry uh, and sugar, that, that just, as Bryony says, it just tells people that they're making the wrong choices. And we know that's not right. A health policy that says diet and exercise will solve the problem is a policy that um, is shaming and blaming, but we know it doesn't work. The results of obesity prevention in every country on the planet have been zero. We haven't we haven't done anything to really counteract the, the, the prevalence. And of course, when it comes to effective care, we have not been delivering to more than a small portion of our community that is uh, one or two percent. It's frightening. So when we look at stigma occurs is, is, is right across the society. Uh, social relationships are, are meant to be the first, the most, most impressive driver of uh, of stigma that people feel and and uh, and so forth. Not surprisingly, it's family and friends. Uh, and then the healthcare setting comes number two. And of course, it's all um, it's 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 all. Uh, increased by uh, mass media, employment situations, etc. It's just part of way, the way we think about obesity. So we need, from the point of view of healthcare workers, and I'll talk more mainly about healthcare work, healthcare area uh, as I go through. Now, when we look at the pathophysiology of the complications of obesity, we in medical spheres, we, we, there's mechanical like arthritis and knee, there's cardiometabolic, which includes diabetes, uh, heart disease, heart failure, and, and a whole string of cancers. And then there's a psychosocial demographic and there's a functional. But in fact, the pathophysiology in most people with really significant problems with obesity uh, include all those. They tend to go hand in hand. And on top of that, we make it worse with the bias, the stigma, and the blaming personal responsibility. If you think that obesity doesn't produce costs in our healthcare system, yet we spend very little treating it, almost nothing, 
um, from a public health point of view or uh, from, a, from a, uh, a treatment point of view. But if we look at this genetic study just published in, in the last few weeks and, and looking at the genes associated with the biggest risk factors of our health, they exclude things that are environmental like smoking and alcohol because they're not highly gen genetically tuned. But these are all high, highly genetically tuned and particularly uh, waist circumference. And you see there that the biggest contributor to overall healthcare costs in our community is A, one, waist circumference. Two is BMI and then there's systolic blood pressure. We can, we can get this information easily from our patients. They, this has come from uh, figures that a study done on the genome in people in Finland, replicated in the United Kingdom in Netherlands. This is telling us that all of those things that cause us chronic disease are really driven, uh, many of them are driven by these, and it's diabetes, cancer, and heart disease. So when we look at the 10-year experience of the allostatic load of being stigmatized, that internal stigma that, that I say is damaging, uh, we see the normal classical metabolic pathways that are associated with obesity. And then we see the stigma discrimination, social, psychological behavior disorders that occur going to the, or the, the allostatic load, inflammation, cardiovascular dysfunction, et cetera, uh, hypothalamic pituitary, activation of sympathetic nervous system, leading to the same problems. So as Bridie said, we are making our patients worse by blaming and shaming them. It's an important point. So if we look at a practice and we look at uh, where people are going for attention, we see the patient down in the bottom there. We see them going to a disempowered, ambivalent, um, you know, ambivalence, ambiguity, a disempowered barrier system of health, frustration, flame, blame, paternalism, stigma, self-blame, demotivation, and a disempowered person. The cycle just doesn't work. And that's the usual health pathway. If there's an empowered, educated program, we've, we've got a, a primary care, and it could be any healthcare professional. We've got a patient that is supported and informed, educated. Psychological care is, is provided and referral provided. Patients are empowered and engaged. We have a totally different cycle. And that cycle is improving, but it's rare. So how do we get um, move forward? Well, we've spent a lot of time getting the language right and, uh, uh, and there's a lot of discussions and there's very little agreement on what terms we should use. Different areas have different, different, uh, uh, different uh, ideas. In fact, if we look at obesity uh, when it's defined as a disease, we, we don't want to lose the obesity word because in fact, it, it identifies the problem we've got to deal with. And not more, more so than that is that we've, when we've had other diseases that have been stigmatized, they've been treated very badly. Um, mental health was, was stigmatized. People didn't use words. Cancers were things that we didn't talk about. Infectious diseases of particular types weren't talked about. So we can't deny the fact that there's a problem, but we need to go beyond what words we use and have effective strategies. This was some, uh, a study come out from the, came out from the UK. Um, uh, people, are, a, a multidisciplinary group, a transdisciplinary group. First, we need to educate healthcare uh, students uh, about the complex fa factors of body regulation and what is driving this condition. Uh, second, we need to move away from the solely weight-centric approach to healthcare uh, and, move, and, and focus on more, in, more on weight inclusive, inclusivity. And lastly, we need to we can need to conduct our research and recognise that uh, that the, the the relationship between weight, health, and mortality, and those increased costs, uh, there are mediators uh, that are very much associated with uh, with weight stigma. So. When we look at training students, and I, I, I won't go through all of these, but I'll just pick out the, the two I've highlighted here. Uh, we, we should always ensure that uh, lectures about the complexity of obesity, the genetics, the social environment determinants, and I can't tell you, there's more than 100 environmental determinants that are very strongly associated with obesity. The science of weight in inclusivity uh, promotion, rather than eliciting pity and saying this is a huge burden and a worrying thing, we should do like we do to cancer. Cancer is a problem, but we don't treat it as the burden and things that's going to break our healthcare system. We treat it 
uh, in a totally different way to obesity uh, and uh, and heart disease and other things are treated the same way. We see this as a burden and a blame situation. Now, I know there's a lot on this slide, but I want again to go to include programs with your people that explain internalised weight bias. Uh, early before, again, and I insist on this, before again starting a behavioural man management program. If you see someone and the first thing you do is to tell them about diet and exercise or have a go at them about diet and exercise, they won't come back. Uh, and uh, it is really important that they understand it's not all their fault and we can help them. We need to help them and we can help them improve their lives. That's the key thing. And weight goals. Weight loss goals. Now, you might be frightened when I say I don't ever give people a goal as to how much weight they're going to lose. I don't ever ask them about that because it's not a goal that really is of great interest to me. It's a great interest to them, but they've usually got a totally unrealistic view of what's happening. In addition, we need to, we need to conquer this weight stigma that internally occurs in, in, our, in our, our patients uh, and we need to empower them. If they think they deserve treatment, they will look for treatment and they'll look for effective treatment to improve their health, improve their lives. So we all hold biases. We all hope, you know, we need to be challenged. And, and if you have a look here, we see that explicit trends in stigma seem to, in bias, seem to be decreasing. But uh, in when it comes to implicit areas, we see weight has increased, disability and age haven't really changed, but sex, race and skin tone uh, have certainly improved. Uh, so we've got a lot of work to do. And uh, my personal biases are evidence-based interventions for both prevention and treatment of obesity, respect for those living with obesity, and critical thinking about evidence. Now, our healthcare, this is the, the final, final bit, our healthcare messaging is very much, very often confused with contra, contra, contradictory ideas, it's confusing, and are delivered with conviction. And, and you all know there's public health messaging that Brian has talked about, which never mentioned stigma um, until recently when we've insisted on it. There's the Hayes group that is so worried, you know, formed because of stigma and the damage it was doing. Uh, there's eating disorders, clinical care, weight inclusivity, uh, diet and exercise. These can all deliver weight stigma. And we have these false dichotomies, prevention versus care, people who believe this is the only way to go and others who um, and, and despite the fact that of repeated failure, obesity versus eating disorders. Could no idea how these two, two groups have different language and different ideas. Weight and health, lifestyle versus the science and physiology of obesity, diabetes and obesity. Why is diabetes treated enthusiastically and this left uh, untreated? So we look at the false dichotomies. We look at this, this, this mess of... Uh, things with 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 practitioners from all types involved, public and uh, and and managing people. Um, these false dichotomies cause weight stigma, and uh, and there's no question that it's that confusion of causality that's uh, that's a real issue. How do we define clinical obesity as a disease? Well, the Lancet Commission's been going for almost two years now. This, I, this slide was some time ago, uh, and we we are working on that. We're, we're, we're defining when it's clinical very clearly, and that should be out uh, at later this year or earlier next year. So I propose that chronic disease management is generally poorly managed our health system doesn't deal with that very well but transdisciplinary approach to care and what i mean by a transdisciplinary approach is not a multidisciplinary or an interdisciplinary it is every all of the stakeholders getting together and understanding the problem and moving with the problem research it's a great tool in research the transdisciplinary approach we use all the tools and people around it. Uh, disease prevention clinical care all require a transitionary approach and addressing stigma provides an excellent example of how we can deal with a complex problem. Okay, and I'll just leave that last slide up. That's from our workshops and, and things that we did over a couple of years, a joint international statement on ending obesity stigma. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks, John. Um, all right, I'm going to ask Bryony if you want to spend a couple minutes, just any reflections or comments on John's talk. 
Yeah, I mean, thank you so much, John. Um, you did a much better explaining the physiological processes of how stigma reinforce um, weight gain. So thank you for that. Um, oh, I really loved your slide on the language use because I think that's something that we can all do and researchers have a real role to play in getting the language right. If we can't get it right, then um, how is anyone else going to get it right? And I think that your point on, um, in, you know, language use can be different depending on the context. So as you said, you're, you know, a clinician and you use terminology that's relevant for the clinical setting. Um, and then when we're talking with consumers, we should use language that's um, appropriate for them and that can be, you know, co-designed with them. Um, and I think it's just really important that we as researchers get the language right and get the, you know, person first and asking people how they would like to be um, spoken about in terms of weight stigma. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about um, as you were talking was this concept of the literature and the evidence um, on body size and how it can be so stigmatising. And I wonder if there's, um, you know, there's a bit of a shift happening now in the literature more broadly where we can really consider the impacts of factors relating to weight stigma and how they are associated with um, factors that we typically consider to be um, associated with obesity or BMI. Um, and the, the, the I think my thought here is that, you know, policies are hopefully um, evidence-based. And if the evidence is a bit um, out of date in the fact that it hasn't adequately considered stigma-related factors, then um, we have a long way to go. And um, it's something I've been reflecting on as a researcher lately because I, I, mean, I did my PhD and a lot of my early work looking at gestational weight gain. Um, and, you know, that's very heavily tied to um, body mass index. And, but I'm doing a lot of consumer work lately. And um, consumers are just really um, disheartened by continually being told they can't do this, they can't do that based on their... BMI and um, just a reflection of mine in, in wondering whether there's there's room for the evidence base to grow in this space. But yeah, thanks for a wonderful talk, John. Thanks, Bryony. Um, John, did you want to respond to any of Bryony's comments and then maybe reflect? Yeah, yeah. I, I, look, I, um, I I thought the I mean I've I've watched the policy over years and seen the most horrendous uh, stigma in policies. Uh, there's one that was released by Vic Health and others about preventing childhood or stopping childhood obesity released a couple of years ago. It was horrifying. It, it, um, uh, it, just, it, just, it just was completely related to uh, increasing exercise and decreasing intake. And it really, it really just smacked, it just is a, as, as a person who works in the science and the biology of this, it's 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 not practical at all. And when we look at policy and we look at guidelines in the obesity world, if you think you know we've had guidelines, we've got guidelines, but they're not. No one takes any notice of them because it's not a disease that we or not a problem that we really need to address. People are ignored. Uh, we have no effective treatments uh, that are readily available. Um, uh, some dietary and exercise things work better than others, but over the long term, do very little. And so we need to we need to really uh, think about those strategies. Make sure that they're real and they look after the people who who have them. Now, the people who are left out of this game are usually the people with the lived experience of obesity. Now, why is it so hard to get them to talk to us? That's because they've got internalized stigma. They don't. They blame themselves. And it's very hard to get a group together who really will look after one another and actually advocate for better care for themselves. And that, that's that's a problem. And so when you've got you know one or two percent of the community or up to five percent for some areas where there is effective care, they're not having it. And that's a global problem. So I, I think we're on the same page. We've really got to address this problem seriously. And without addressing it, uh, I see this as the greatest barrier to treating people and managing people for their health with living with obesity. And it's a huge barrier to prevention. If we keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, it's not going to happen. And we're doing the same thing over and over again. And we, I don't expect a different result. 
Great, thanks, John. Yeah, really um, important, powerful points. And the, I, I was thinking when you're talking about internalized stigma being one of the reasons why it's hard for us to get um, people with lived experience to, to to speak to us, us being in this case health uh, policy makers or clinicians. Part of that's also because you know, we're the source of harm, right? We're the, the perpetrators of harm. So why would they um, want to come and, and speak to us? So I think we have a lot of um, work to do in, in repairing that, that relationship as well. Um, I want to open it up to questions now. Um, so I might uh, do a sort of alternating between Zoom and in uh, in the room, uh, depending on how many questions we've got. I can see someone's already raised their hand. So um, do you want to, I'll just do this here. Um, I'm not sure it was just a, stu uh, a staff Rosalie. number. Oh, Rosalie, did you want to unmute yourself and, and ask the question? Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Um, two, two halves to the question. The first half is how do you contend with clinicians who would see this presentation and the commentaries about stigma as a side issue or that they see it as political correctness? That's one part of the question. And the other part is that when you talk about lived experience and people not wanting to talk to researchers, I think there's a, an interesting split because there seem to be a group of people where um, a, they talk about fat shaming and talk about being proud and fat um, at one end of the spectrum and others who are saying, well, how are you designating us as people with lived experience because you've just labelled us? So just how do you deal with that or what's, what are your recommendations in contending with both of those groups um, at one end and at the other in terms of the clinicians? You want me to? Yeah. Um, look, I think the biology is slowly getting through to most clinicians. Uh, only recently, cardiologists were a group of people who really didn't have any that it was diet and exercise that was there. They're lazy people. They don't do what they're told. And suddenly we find uh, that the drugs that really work uh, for managing weight and work very effectively change dietary choices, change their, their appetite, they lose a lot of weight, their heart gets better. And there's a, there's a type of heart failure that they're just, they are, they're at the moment saying, oh, look, this, this, this might be a real, a real problem. Atrial fibrillation goes up. So things in their world that are suddenly changing as a result of adding a treatment that we now have has just changed the picture altogether. They've never been able to treat these things before. We see it with liver disease. We're seeing it with the kidney. We're seeing it with uh, sleep apnea and, 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 and breathing problems. Uh, the evidence has been there for a long, long time because there's nothing new in any of that. Bariatric surgery has shown us that, that before. Now, when I talk about... Um, uh, people with the, with the lived experience that are stigmatised, uh, I, I mean the people who would uh, will stand up and advocate for, um, for themselves. Uh, and if we look at, you know, it, it, we have struggled for years to get a group of the lived experience together and, and actually jump up and down like the diabetes group, the cancer group or the heart disease group or any, any um, small cancer group to say, we need better care, we need health, we need health, uh, appropriate health, right across the board. I'm talking about whole of life health uh, for, for the problems they have. That group, uh, WIN, Weight Issues Network, was developed in 2019. It's, it's, it's largely based in Sydney. Uh, it's a nascent group. Uh, and it mainly is, is functioning at the moment as a, as a, as a um, I suppose, more, more a, a group getting together to really talk to one another but really they're not ready to actually join the world of advocating for their, their rights and, and, and uh, uh, their rights and, and acknowledging uh, that they're being blamed and shamed. Thank you. We've got a lot of work to do. Can I, can I add to that conversation? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, most of my work occurs in the, with the 
uh, preconception, pregnant and postpartum population. And so um, a lot of the work I do around weight stigma in maternity care is that people are, are shamed for their body size when they enter pregnancy, but it's something you can't change like whatever your BMI is when you or your weight when you enter pregnancy like that's it right and so um I like uh, I conceptualize it as in two ways one it's a person who feels stigmatized because of their body size but you can also have lived experience of weight stigma and that doesn't matter what your body size is it's that personal experience of um being stigmatized and so I suppose that's just an, another way of looking at and what lived experience means. Do we have any questions in the room? Yep, did you want to come up and ask so just so everyone can hear? We've got one question in the room. Okay. Um, thank you both for the presentation today. This was very interesting. Like as a health student, we hear a lot about the stigma that clinicians possess, but it's interesting getting like, a, I guess, um, opinions from people working in that field specifically. Um, this one's for both, but Professor Dixon, you might have a more um, informed opinion here, perhaps just due to your clinical work. So you mentioned that we should move to a more like health focused approach um, and that you say personally don't give weight loss goals as a metric for health. So I was wondering, as say a potential future clinician, what are those metrics that you would recommend we kind of associate with health when we're talking to patients? Good, yeah, when, I, when I'm talking about a treatment, I might talk to people about the average result, but if we look at any treatment, any management, we see this enormous standard deviation. There's some people who do brilliantly with diet and exercise and they tell everyone, everyone else can do it, and they're a small group. They're, they're generally towards the outlier end. So what I don't want to do is to set people up for, for repeated failure because they've had repeated failure. So I, I prefer to go with smart goals, you know, things that are that are, are doable, things that we can evaluate. Look, someone, someone who's got a problem and is willing to come and see me and discuss it, and I teach them about stigma, I teach them about issues, uh, and then we then we when we work into we work with dietitians, we work with psychologists, we work with exercise physiologists to improve their function and life. But I don't, I'm not focused on, yeah, you should be losing 20% of your body weight because I know that's not possible for the vast majority of people. What what's happening is that they they believe, and when I, we've done research on this, we see that uh, in general practice both in Australia and elsewhere, it's around 20% that most, health, most, most practitioners feel a patient's got to lose. Most of the benefits in preventing diabetes in the first 5% and most of the benefits for health come in the first 10%. So it's not coming to a normal weight. What, weight normality is not what we're looking for. We're looking for that modest weight loss that's sustained. And if we can get 10% that's sustained, we will see an enormous drop in all of the health issues related to obesity, including cardiovascular, including cancer, diabetes, et cetera. And we'll have people living much healthier lives. If they're allowed to live uh, with a BMI still over 40, you know, over 30, if in fact it was originally 50. That's the sort of thing we have to do. So I want wins for people. I want them to be able, look, for people who've seen a dietitian before and don't want to see one again, if I can over time get them to see a dietitian who really gets the disease they're treating and helps them, that's a win. That's a win for that person. And when they come back to me and say, I've been bad, I've done the wrong thing, which they do all the time, that is my, my that's not, thank you for coming back, but you didn't need to tell me about that. We've, we've already told you that it's not bad. It's not a problem. This is why I want to see. I don't want to see the person who's done very, very well and they come in all the time. I want to see the people who are having trouble. Uh, and that's our job as clinicians. That's our job in trying to improve the health and lifestyle and quality of life and psychological well-being of people living with obesity. So I, I'm very wary about targets and setting targets. By the way, targets... Uh, in, in obesity and, and management areas, targets don't work. There's no evidence that they improve outcome. They generally produce stigma. But there's another thing that doesn't work, and that's a thing um, called motivation. 
There's no evidence that a person coming to a weight loss management program that's motivated or not motivated will do any differently at the end of it. We have done research on that and others have done research on it. When we start thinking about this, it's not the person's fault. We, they just haven't had the right environment, a therapeutic environment that's going to really help them. So it's not, you know, we don't, we don't have these ideas about who's going to do it and are they ready to do it? We don't do that for cancer. We don't do that for heart disease. We don't do that for diabetes. We, we don't do that for depression. We don't do that for any of the things. Um, we don't do it for eating disorders. What we have to do is deal with the problem and accept the problem and work with it. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I saw there was a question in the chat. Uh, Laura, would you like me to read the question out or did you want to just ask it? Yeah, I can ask you. Can you hear me all right? Sorry? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, cool. Um, I was basically just thinking I was about the fact that I'm someone who works in the behaviour change side of things. I'm working in the intervention space um, for people with severe obesity. But I'm always conscious of the fact that really we're just dealing you know, with almost like the end of the cycle that people are coming through, you know, these people already suffer from the consequences of, you know, poor policy, you know, kind of poor weight environment um, that kind of leads us to like this point, which is obviously as well as you've explained, John, the genetics and things like that. And always kind of worrying that maybe a lot of this focus on interventional work really detracts from the responsibility um, of better, you know, better weight management policy, you know, further back and creating better environments, supporting like food, social, housing, things like that, that, you know, can give people more stable lives. Um, but really, how can we, as people working in a space, be kind of better advocates for these kind of other policy areas that don't probably concern the work? Um, and also as a follow-up, you know, other things that we can do, such as realist evaluations and stuff like that, that really emphasize and explore the people and the journeys of people who have come to these services and these pathways that might support, you know, this emphasis on, on, on the stuff that might actually help people earlier on. Yeah, thanks, Laura. It was a little bit cutting out, um, but um, we do have your question in the chat as well. Uh, John or Bryony, maybe Bryony, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, sure. Um, so I also came from a behaviour change um, background. And so I think what's what clear to me is that People should still have agency to optimize their diet and physical activity behaviors. Um, the way, you know, and how that occurs is influenced by their environment, but we can still make good choices. Um, and so I, you know, there's a there's a time and a place. Um, but it's about delivering that those interventions or that care with you know kindness and understanding um the context to make sure we're not stigmatizing. Um, and not reinforcing that blame narrative and that individual responsibility narrative. So, so we still have agency to make our own choices and, um, you know, we should never forget that. But going back to that point I made about policies, we have to think about it in the context of the environment. We can't just, you know, um, say that the environment is never important. Um, I hopefully I've semi-answered your question. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I'm not saying forget diet and exercise. When I see people who've exercised and uh, got fed up with exercise, uh, when we looked, we've done a study where we've looked at people with diabetes and the bigger they are, the more they, they agree with all of the areas of uh, treating their diabetes except for two, diet and exercise. They know they don't work. They don't like doing them. There's barriers to them, et cetera. Now, of the, of, the, of the people I refer to, uh, a, a clinical exercise physiologists are some of the best people I know. They're fantastic. They can get people who, are, who, who can't get out of a chair or can't go far, act up and around and functional, doing things they've never done for years without weight loss. We mustn't think that a quality diet is going to solve the problem of weight. It's, it is it is a very healthy thing and it will help if we can we can match it in so once we've got a little bit of control we can actually work much better with behavioral change but to go to those people living with obesity living with diabetes with a bmi of a 40 and telling them the diet and exercise is going to help them they don't have that faith 
We've educated exercise physiologists very well in the sense that we don't expect exercise to be a dramatic way to lose weight unless you're exercising four to six hours a day and you're training. And I know people who've done that and uh, and and so forth. But exercise is for for brain function. It's for it's for it's for it's for physical function. Uh, we did a randomized trial of exercise, no exercise, with the same dietary treatment. And the, 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 the group who had the exercise, same weight at the end of two years, but they think they were less, they were less, um, they were less, they had less mood issues, but they had better fun, fit and mental function. They were really different. And so we, we've got to advertise, we've got to promote these weight, so, so the weight loss things as being healthy parts of life that are going to improve their quality of life and improve their function and improve their health but to to have the, the the whole idea of doing this for someone who's very big that it's going to produce weight loss in a dramatic way is is they know wrong and we know wrong for most great um great questions unfortunately we are out of time um so um i'll we'll have to wrap up but if anyone does have any other questions please feel free to email me and i can forward them on to Bryony um, and john i know we all love uh the three of us love talking about these issues i'm very happy to continue those conversations um so i just want to yeah final thank you and round of applause to our speakers And um, for those on campus, please uh, feel free to join us at Badger & Co for some appetizers and drinks. Um, and everyone else, um, thank you so much for joining us and yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening.